you know, the thing I find about life is that in order for you to find whatever it is that your purpose in life is truly going to be, it's going to be based on the journey that you take. Now, I am 51 years old now. And what I'm doing today, if I sort of trace my steps back, is going to be based on the fact that I've done little, little things along the way that's brought me to where I am today. And I can tell you that when I was your age, 1920, I had no idea at the time that this is what I wanted to be doing. I knew that I wanted to do something great. I know all of you have sat here and said you want to do great things. But the word of advice that I'll give, thinking back, is that I wish that I had started doing what I'm doing now sooner. Do you understand? So the benefits that you have from speaking and engaging people like myself and the other speakers that you've had is the benefit of experience is that it's important to start thinking as quickly as you can about some of those things. You see, we have to be specific. They always say when you set goals, they must be smart. Do you understand what the smart, you know the smart principle? And the smart principle is based on the fact that your goals must be specific. So S stands for specific, yeah? M stands for the fact that you must be able to measure your goals, yeah? Um, R stands for the fact that they must be realistic, and T, they must be time-bound. Now, A, I believe, stands for the, you must be able to achievable. achieve, achieve, achievable. so achievable. So you've got specific, you've got measurable, you've got achievable, you've got realistic, you've got time-bound. So, because at times, we set ourselves, we don't, it, there's no point in setting ourselves up to fail, you know, and that's not to say that we shouldn't have big dreams. But we need to ensure that whatever big dreams we have, we break those dreams down so that we can achieve those dreams in bite sizes. So if I go back, for example, let me just take Ebony Life Television. Let me even just take Moments with Mo as an example. Yeah? So here I am, and I say, I want to start a talk show. Now, I had never done anything like that in my life before. I'd been worked in oil and gas for many years. I then crossed over to running, I resigned and crossed over to running my own consultancy business. And then one day I wake up and say, I want to become a talk show hostess. But then what were, what were the different steps I was going to have to take? I mean, what did I have to do? I first had to go and learn about what it was to become a talk show hostess. That meant watching a lot of other people that have done this job before. So the person that I saw as the person that I could look up to that most resembled what I wanted to do was Oprah Winfrey. So I then invested and ordered, she had a box set of then I think her 20 or 25th year um, anniversary of all the episodes that she had recorded. And that for me was my job for the next few months. I watched and watched and watched those episodes for a very long time to just understand what it was to engage and to interview. That was the first thing I did. The next thing I did was I got a tutor because running my consultancy business, I, we have a training and development arm. So one of my best facilitators was a gentleman called Tony Osin Osime. So I said, Tony, I want to go on TV. I want to be a presenter, but I don't know how to do this. And there's no, nothing wrong. Don't be ashamed and say, you know it. Because if you don't know it, you don't know it. Teach me how to present. So every weekend, he and I would sit in a room, we would have a camera like this. I would sit back and I would imitate as if I was on a show. Hello and good morning or hello and good afternoon. My name is so, so, so. And on the show today, we're going to do X, Y, Z. And then we'd play the tape back and he would say, no, that's not how it's done. Look how Oprah did it. Look how Ellen DeGeneres did it. Look how this. We had different, you know, relevant personalities out there that we were referring to. Now, when I saw that he himself was not exactly a trainer for TV presenting, but I thought, let me get started with that. I then said to myself, I'm going to invest further and go on a training course in the UK. So I went to the usual place where we all do research. I went to the webs, I went online, Googled how to become a TV presenter training courses in the UK. And I saw various ones and I decided to attend one at the London School of Media. So I sent myself off to London to learn. You know, um, I was, I had turned 40 at that time. Can 
can ask a question. Yeah. Did you start the, uh, the show then or you were just training? No, I was still training. This was all this was now. all training. This was I can't say I'm going to do this thing. I don't know how to do it. At this point, all I knew is that I wanted to do this thing, but first of all, let me go and get trained. So I went to London. I went on this course. I was 40 at the time. I met all the everybody I was the oldest person there. Everybody there was young like you guys. I'm sure they're thinking, what's this old mama coming here to come and I said, okay, it doesn't matter. I fitted in with the rest of the group and I spent my time there and, I, and at the end of the course, they give you the cassette. Because at the end of it, like you have to graduate and you have to then, you know, they put you on like a, on a set where you're interviewing somebody and you're relating to them. So all I had at that point of myself on television was this tape, videotapes of me being taught and then having to then act as if I was really on television. I did. I then came back to Nigeria and they said, okay, what is the next thing I need to do now? I then went along to NTA. I didn't think NTA was going to work for me. I wanted, a, I had a big vision, a big dream. So I went along to see the managing director of DSTV Multi-Choice. I didn't know him. So you don't have to know the person that, and let me just say, word of advice, the people that have helped me the most have been strangers. Sometimes the people you know the most may see you in a particular light. So the people that knew me the most saw me as this corporate executive, and they were all wondering why I wanted to cross over into the world of media. They didn't understand. They thought I was absolutely crazy. And I was trying to tell them that, listen, I need this as a launch pad because I saw down the road that there was going to be a bigger dream than that. So at this point in time, the next big thing to do was to say, okay, how am I going, what platform am I going to put the show on? Where's the show going to be? So I went along and had, I found who this gentleman was, didn't know him from Adam, bugged him to death. I plan to write a book next year. The book is going to be called Persistence. Because if there's anything in this life that gets you through from A to B, it is the ability to be persistent over a prolonged period of time. So no matter what it is that you want to achieve in your lives, if you are persistently seeking ways to achieve it, you will. But I think when people say they have failed, this is my theory, by the way, it's because they have given up. They may have been doing it for one year. They may have been doing it for two years. You don't know how long the journey is going to be. It took me five years to get Ebony Life Television launched. Imagine if I'd given up after the first year, thinking, oh, this isn't going to happen. Even with moments with Mo, for the first 20 months, I didn't, there was no traction, there was nothing. It's not to say that I quit my, I was still running my consultancy firm, but I was still giving it as much attention as I could on the side as well. So I go along and I get an opportunity to now present to DSTV. But before I did that, I invested again in a beautiful presentation. I made this beautiful box where I put the presentation in. So when they opened the box itself, it was like, wow, what is this? Let's see this woman. You know, because how you present yourself is very, very important. I went along and my consultancy experience helped me. I was able to stand up, flick with a PowerPoint presentation. This is who we are. This is what we want to do. This is how we're going to do it. Beautiful presentation. And at the end of it all, they said to me, no, we're not interested. I was, I was so, so upset. Initially, they were like, we're interested, and they said they weren't interested. But I wasn't taking no for an answer. Do you know, after they said no, I went back and I said, why are you saying no? And then somehow, through dialogue and discussions, I got them to turn the no into a yes. But there were conditions attached to the yes. The conditions were that we cannot commission the show. Commission means they're not going to invest in the show. It means you're going to have to invest in the show yourself. So how are you going to fund the show? Where are you going to shoot the show? I had no studio. I mean, as you know, we don't have enough infrastructure with regards to hospitals and schools in Nigeria, let alone studios. So I was battling, where am I going to shoot this show? So eventually, to cut a long story short, I went along to City Mall, and I saw, saw this space that was empty, and they said to me I could rent the space. So here's the space. This is the cost to produce. I had a nice budget, but I had no money because DSTV had said, we're not going to commission. We'll buy the show from you once you have made it, which meant I had to have made the show first 
So what was the next thing that I went to do? And I went out talking to sponsors, finding, you see, anytime you're out there looking for a sponsor, you must be able to offer your sponsor value. It could be a sponsor, it could be anybody, it doesn't matter. What are the benefits for them? You can't go begging. You, begging can only last you for so long. You can only beg someone to do you a favor for so long. The reality at the end of the day is that you're going to enter into a business relationship with somebody who must find benefit in that thing that you are selling. And if they don't see the benefit in it, they're not going to buy it. They may buy it once because they like you or because you're pretty or because you're beautiful, but the second or third time, they ain't going to buy it. So you better know how you're going to go from being beautiful and selling it to them the first time to how you're going to sustain that for a, long, for a longer period of time. So it was important for me to give my sponsors benefit. So I said to my sponsors, I will give you every single advert break during my show. You can have your advert break. We will do episodes around your business. If it's farming, we'll go to the farm and do an episode about farming. If it's agriculture, if it's fashion, whatever your business is, we will showcase and highlight what your business is. I'll even integrate the colors of your brand into my set so that they can see that this show is your show. The opening billboard will say, Moments with Mo, brought to you by MTN. During the breaks, Moments with Mo was brought to you by MTN. At the end of the show, Moments with Mo was brought to you by MTN with their advert breaks and all of this back and forth. So that is how I was able to get sponsors on board. But prior to that, to even getting the sponsors on board, I had a meeting with a particular gentleman, then the managing director of Skybank, and I said to him, sponsor my show, because I wanted a telco sponsor. You know, sometimes use the word exclusivity for these things. So I came up with this plan of I want an exclusive tele, tele, teleco sponsor, telecom sponsor, an exclusive banking sponsor, and an exclusive fast-moving consumer goods sponsor. And you will be the exclusive sector industry sponsor. And they like to hear that. Sometimes you have to find a way to get them to compete with each other. The banks are very competitive. The telcos are very competitive. Nigerian breweries and um, Diageo are very competitive because they are all selling the same products and they all want to grab marketplace. So how do you get them to grab marketplace? Sometimes it's by offering them exclusivity. So I went along and had a meeting with Skybank and the MD said, Mr. Akifemi, that because I spoke with so much passion that he's not going to sponsor the show. He wants to invest in my company. And I'm thinking, okay, that's an interesting angle. So sometimes you go into a meeting looking for one thing, you come out of the meeting with something else that's even better. Do you understand? Because an investment meant that we had more funding. So that was how I was able to get Moments With More started. But before I got to that point, there were lots and lots of rejections. I was disappointed by a major bank that promised to sponsor. Last minute, they said that they weren't sponsoring. I was totally gutted. But that did not deter me. It even made me more determined that, OK, because you've said no, I'm going to prove to you that I'm going to find somebody that is going to say yes. And I therefore made it my, you know, um, my conviction to do so. And, and pretty much, that's how I got Moments With More started. But then, OK, now I've got the studio, right? Now, um, I've, so I had enough money to pay for the studio. I had a sponsor. But I still had to produce the show, right? I had no staff, so I had to go out and look for the team. The team is very, very important. Never ever think you can do it alone. It is not possible. It's, import it's important that you build your team and you play the significant role that you can play. Whatever your purpose, whatever your passion is, do that and let those that are specialists in other things come in to be a part of that team. As you can see, whatever Katrina is doing is not what Val's doing. They all play different roles in the organization to get things done. And that's exactly what I had, I had to find producers. I had to find a director of the show. I had to find someone to do social media, et cetera, et cetera. It was about building the team. So I finally built the team. Now we need the guests. It's a talk show, right? I need to engage. Who am I going to interview? And again, I went for the biggest fish I could find. I went after Professor Wally Shoyinka. I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of him with the big afro. And I thought, I wanted to start this show with a bang. I want people to watch and you know that, wow, 
how was she able to, and I went after this man, as in I must have called him. I don't even know how many times I called him and how many times, I, I don't, did, I, did we have mobile phones then? Maybe not so much. So I was looking for him, this was in 2000, this was in 2006. So I was looking everywhere for this man. I looked for him so much, eventually he had no choice than to say, okay Mo, let's do the show. And that's basically how I got my first episode on air. So it was good track record for me to be able to say to anybody else in Nigeria, listen, I have interviewed Professor Wale Shoyinka. So why don't you, you know, why can't I interview you? This is this most intelligent man. You know, I'd researched all about him so I knew what questions to ask. Because the worst thing is to be in that profession, sitting there, interviewing somebody as brilliant as Professor Wale Shoyinka and then you ask him a stupid question like, what did you have for dinner last night or something? He's just going to think, why is she here? Do you understand? So those were some of the critical factors that we had to do on getting Moments with More started. And then it was about building relationships, looking for more sponsors, making sure your sponsors are happy, giving them the feedback, sending them the episodes that they were in, just to let them know that you were doing your job. Because sometimes they may not be watching the show at that time. So it's important for them to know that you've been able to tick all the boxes. Press releases were going out. We're pleased to let you know that MTN is our headline sponsor. Virgin, then Virgin Nigeria was also a sponsor. Brass Motors was a sponsor because we had one season where we gave away a brand new car. We had to look for incentives to get people to watch our show. <laughs>